Thank you for joining us. Public diplomacy is more essential now than ever, and our special program today takes us to Toronto, Canada, where we had the honor of interviewing Israel's Consul General, Galit Bar-Am. She will share her thoughts on the friendship of Canada with Israel and the Jewish community following these messages. Life Extension Magazine brings you new discoveries in health and anti-aging. Our science-based research and supplements are so advanced, they're many years ahead of the medical mainstream with quality control standards that exceed FDA mandates. Life Extension has covered groundbreaking medical research for more than 35 years. For your health and future, you deserve the best. Learn more at lifeextension.com. The space to dream, to create, to build, any room in your home can become a comfortable space that's all your own with a carrier ductless system. There's simply nothing more efficient. With comfort controls you can set with your smartphone, filters for cleaner, fresher air, and humidity settings that are easy to adjust. It's just one more way Carrier helps make you comfortable, however you define it. Carrier, turn to the experts. When I was young, it seemed that life was so wonderful. A miracle, oh it was beautiful, magical. And then they showed me a world where I could be so dependable, oh intellectual, cynical. Find magic again. Sprout by HP. With Intel RealSense technology inside, now you can bend the rules of creativity outside. With us now is Consul General Galit Ba'am. A pleasure and honor to have you on the Shalom Show. Welcome to the Consulate in Toronto. I'm so impressed, really. Beautiful new Consulate. But we're not here to talk about real estate, but more important things. Please share with our audience what the role of the Consulate General is here in Canada. Well, uh, in, uh, in countries, usually the highest uh, level of diplomatic representation is an embassy, and an embassy is located in a capital city. In the case of the United States, our embassy is located in Washington, D.C. But in addition to that, in large enough uh, countries in which it is difficult for an embassy to cover the entire area, then um, the area is covered to many, many embassies, which are called uh, consulates general. Uh, in the United States, there are eight consulates in addition to our embassy in Washington, D.C. And here in Canada, in addition to our embassy in Ottawa, we have two consulates, one in Montreal and one in Toronto that covers Ontario and Western Canada. Uh, we do political work. We are very active uh, on the economic level. We do academic exchange and cultural exchange. We're very involved in that. And uh, social media, of course. And we maintain very close relations with the Jewish community. How are the relations between Jewish people here in this great city and in Israel? Well, when it comes to the Jewish uh, community of Toronto and in general the Jewish community in Canada, I have only compliments and, uh, and good things to say. Uh, this is a remarkable community which is very engaged, uh, very supportive of Israel. Uh, members of this community volunteer in Israel. They send their children to serve as lone soldiers. They, uh, they keep property in Israel, they travel back and forth, they send uh, missions, they send their own children to Israel uh, on birthright and other programs. And uh, when, they, when their sons and daughters are students, many of them spend a semester in Israel as well. Uh, from afar, they support many causes and organizations in Israel. And I believe that most Israelis are not even aware uh, of, the, of the great contribution and devotion of, uh, of uh, Canadian Jewry. And this is uh, definitely my responsibility as an Israeli diplomat serving in this country uh, to provide information about that and, uh, and uh, to, to uh, teach about the great contribution of this community to Israel. Speaking of contributions, it's interesting that Israel contributes so much to the world. From the days when Israel exported oranges and flowers to Europe and now high-tech all over the world, much to the admiration of many, 
and jealousy of others. Tell us how you view the accomplishments and achievements of the State of Israel. Israel um, is celebrating its 70th year of independence this year. And uh, there are many reasons uh, to, to celebrate Israel's uh, dramatic achievements. It's a small country. We started with citrus oranges, with the export to the European market and the American market. Uh, it was very fashionable at the time in the 50s and 60s to give a crate of citrus fruit for Christmas. Uh, and we started with that, a small country that absorbed a very large number of uh, refugees and immigrants, uh, Holocaust survivors from all over the world, and, uh, and had to uh, provide work and support and shelter for all these newcomers and defend its borders. A nascent uh, state, a small country, uh, very weak in, in a very problematic region, and it's still one of the most problematic neighborhoods, uh, roughest neighborhoods on, on the face of the, of the, of the world. Uh, and, uh, and since then we've uh, developed and evolved dramatically. We started with uh, military technology, advanced military technology. We had, to, we had to rely on our resources and our good education um, and uh, wonderful universities that provided excellent graduates. And, uh, and we had, uh, we, we had uh, and still have a very strong uh, army, the Israeli Defense Forces. So much of the technology that was uh, used in the time for military purposes later on was adapted to civilian use as well in the field of communications, in the field of uh, cyber security, for example, uh, in the field of, uh, of uh, medicine and uh, emergency medicine especially. Israel is one of the leading countries in the world uh, nowadays, a startup nation, and we pride ourselves of, of being a startup nation. Uh, so many companies represent um, this original, I would say, out of the box thinking that is very common in Israel, a certain lack of respect to hierarchy, which is also very common, very, uh, uh, very prevalent in Israeli society. And we see a growing number of Israeli high-tech companies uh, which work mainly in the United States. The United States is definitely a very important market for Israeli companies, for entrepreneurs, uh, but also in Canada. We see a growing number of Israeli companies represented here in Canada as well, in the greater Toronto area and in Vancouver. Back to public diplomacy, I was just thinking of the higher standard Israel is apparently held to, a compliment Israel does not need, and the lies by omission perpetrated by media in general, ignoring horrific events in one part of the world and then focusing on Israel when there are some unfortunate things that happen there. But actually, uh, there is this hypocrisy that's taking place, a media bias. What's your view on that? Social media is definitely a very important diplomatic tool when it comes to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We're very proud of the fact that already 25 years ago, the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs was the first to have a website. At that time, 25 years ago, it was quite an achievement. When it comes to social media, definitely this is a very important diplomatic tool. Uh, when it comes to the coverage of Israel, the tendency sometimes is to concentrate on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and many other issues that are very important as well um, alarming, especially in the Middle East, are totally neglected. One example is the situation in Syria, the floods of uh, refugees, um, waves of refugees that are flooding the Middle East and Europe as well, um, the tension between um, uh, sovereign countries in our region and the rise of armed militias and terror organizations in the Middle East. All this is pushed aside and the tendency usually is to concentrate on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, and we believe in Israel that the situation, of course, is more complex, that the picture is more complex, that the situation could not be judged in terms of black and white. There are 50 shades of gray in the middle, even though I hate using this term, 50 <laughs> shades of gray. But, but uh, definitely the situation is, uh, is complex and should be perceived, should be seen in its full complexity. So we use social media as a diplomatic tool to provide information about Israel, about geopolitical issues, about uh, regional issues, but also about Israeli society and about Israeli culture and lifestyle and cuisine. And uh, there are many people around the world who are extremely interested in what Israel has to offer. What surprises me is the lack of harmony and the friction between different elements within the Jewish community and others in the United States, for example, and everywhere, I guess, and of course in the Knesset, it seems 
inconsistent and totally wrong priority. Uh, if there's an emergency, everybody should be united and cooperate, but all of this backstabbing and focusing on, on trivial things, in my mind, I think is tantamount to treason. I can, I can speak about Israeli society. Israeli society is uh, diverse. There are many voices and many opinions that are exp expressed by Israelis on the right and on, on the left. Uh, many of them are, are Zionist, many of them support Israel, and they will do whatever is necessary to protect their country. Um, public debate in Israel tends to be loud. This is the way we are. This is what makes us Israeli. Uh, it's heated, it's passionate, it's loud. Um, that's the way we conduct uh, things. But when Israel is in trouble, when Israel is under attack, then people unite on the right and on the left uh, from different sectors of society to defend their homeland. We see that in Jewish communities throughout the world as well, in North America, especially here. I can, I can uh, speak about the, the Canadian example, and I know for sure that when Israel is in a situation in which uh, it needs the support of world Jewry, of the diaspora, then, then Jews unite here and they support Israel and they do whatever they can to ensure the security and safety and sovereignty of the state of Israel from afar. And this support is crucial, this support is vital. I was going to mention that a Democrat, a famous Democrat, arguably the most famous lawyer in the world, Alan Dershowitz, has been on my show many times, his own family members have been criticizing him furiously because he said positive things about Trump moving the embassy. I'm not going to venture opinions, I'm trying to be neutral actually. Whoever is good to Israel, I say thank you for your support, whether it's Mike Huckabee or whoever it is, that's my personal view. What are your thoughts with regard to the fact that the United States has finally recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital? When the United States moved, actually moved the, the uh, embassy to Jerusalem, there was a, quite a celebration in, in Israel at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. A big reception was held in, in honor of our uh, American friends. And uh, a very curious situation was created in Israel on that particular day in which uh, people were celebrating in Jerusalem the move of the American uh, embassy uh, to our capital. People in Tel Aviv were celebrating the victory of Israel in the Eurovision Song Contest, jumping into water fountains dancing all over the city, while in the south our soldiers were defending the borders um, uh, be, with, uh, with, the, with the Palestinian Authority, with, with Gaza, uh, defending uh, Israel and the civilian population um, with, with all these uh, very violent uh, clashes. So it's, um, this dichotomy pretty much represents uh, Israeli society with all its uh, beauty and, and complexity. When it comes to Jerusalem, um, I have only one thing to say as an Israeli diplomat, as a trained archaeologist, because I used to be an archaeologist before I joined the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Israel finds itself in, in a ridiculous situation in which it has to prove over and over again a 3,000-year-old connection between the people of Israel and the land of Israel and between the Jewish people and its eternal capital, Jerusalem. And I find it personally preposterous. I find it ridiculous. Um, there is archaeological evidence. I myself participated in digs. Uh, and the finds show and prove this, this uh, connection of thousands of years uh, between our people and our land. Uh, but in, in many cases, we find ourselves, Israeli diplomats, defending the cause of Israel in the international arena uh, with the international organizations. We believe, the Israeli government believes, that all countries should move their embassies to Jerusalem. The United States uh, was the first country to move its embassy to, to Jerusalem. Others uh, followed, and we expect others to do the same decision and to move their embassies to Jerusalem as well. And they absolutely should. What a hypocritical world we live in. Amazing. And speaking of scientific fact, I'm fascinated by the thought that you were an archaeologist. I was on the Golan Heights once doing a show and uh, standing on a road there. On one side was a barbed wire fence and in three languages it said danger mines, landmines. On the other side were vineyards planted by Jews. Landmines planted by the Syrians to kill. Wine Grapes on the other side. What a paradox that is. And of course, back to archaeology, what do the critics of Israel, how can they respond when we point out that in Katsurin on the Golan Heights, there's absolute irrefutable evidence, proof 
of a Jewish presence there, 3,000 years. And no archaeology that supports uh, any Muslim uh, presence. Of course, Islam only has existed now for 1,300 years, 700 years after Christianity came into the world. And what are they doing to Christians in Egypt who preceded them by 700 years, butchering them in their churches? Anyway, so let's talk about archaeology again. Irrefutable facts, as you say. Please dwell on that a little. Well, it comes to, to archaeology of the, of the Holy Land, of course, there is uh, a plenty of evidence of uh, Jewish existence in Israel, which started already in the Iron Age. This is the time of the United Kingdom of Israel and then the two kingdoms, the divided kingdoms of Judea and, and uh, Israel. Um, there is evidence from the Hellenistic period and the Roman period and the Byzantine era and of, before that the Persian era of uh, Jewish existence in synagogues, in Jewish symbols, the menorah in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in writings and texts in, in Hebrew, in, uh, in, uh, in ancient letters. And uh, of course, um, every textbook that teaches the, the history and the archaeology of the Holy Land will, will include uh, this information. Um, the, there is also Muslim existence in Israel in later periods of time, and, and, and uh, Israel has been conquered so many times uh, by different armies, by different empires, and it's built, archaeologically speaking, as a wedding cake, layer upon layer upon layer of history. And, uh, and the connection, of course, the connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel is, uh, is an integral part of it. It's a basic element in the history of, uh, of uh, the Holy Land in, in general. Um, that, that this evidence is provided by, by archaeologists, not only Israeli archaeologists, uh, researchers, uh, biblical uh, researchers from all over the world and archaeologists as well, who are aware of this fact. When it comes from the international community, when it comes from international um, organizations that question this fact, this is of course um, very frustrating. Very frustrating for Israeli citizens, for Israeli diplomats, and for Israeli archaeologists who are aware of, of this truth, of this historic truth. The ultimate chutzpah on the part of the world, I would say, this inconsistency. On a more positive note, I'd like to ask you to share with our audience what is currently happening in Israel? What new amazing projects are at hand? Well, I can just uh, I can talk forever about Israel. Uh, we could continue this interview until the end of time. Uh, when it comes to Israeli society, we just celebrated uh, a, a, the Pride Parade in, in Tel Aviv. A quarter of a million people showed up. Uh, for this uh, Pride Parade. Uh, Toronto is going to hold its own Pride Parade later on this weekend, and uh, I want to see how many people will show up to, for that. Uh, so when it comes to, to uh, minority rights and, and women's rights and, and gay rights in Israel, of course, we have a lot uh, to offer. Uh, when it comes to our, the amazing achievements of our, of our high-tech uh, companies, I can say only good things. They represent Israel. With, with pride. It's so impressive to see these young and women and how much they do for the sake of Israeli economy and uh, for the sake of Israeli society in general in building bridges between Israel and North America, the United States and, and Canada. I also want to, to talk about two particular sectors in Israeli society, Israeli Arabs and the Israeli ultra-Orthodox, uh, who are more and more integrated into mainstream society and they contribute more and more to, to the workforce and to Israeli economy, and I think this is wonderful. It's really great to see that. This is also very interesting, and I don't really like talking about negatives, but I just can't help bringing up something that really annoys the hell out of me, and that is the BDS movement. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts with regard to that? Well, boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel, the BDS movement definitely attracts a lot of attention. At the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it's very high on our agenda. We follow this uh, activity, especially on social media. But I have to tell you, I know that many people are extremely worried about BDS, especially parents who send their kids to university, to college, and uh, they want to make sure that the, their children study in a protected environment, that they're allowed to, to study well and to party a bit, which is also uh, needed for, for college students and university students. And they're worried about expressions and manifestations of BDS on campus. Uh, but we, Israeli diplomats, when we look into this phenomenon of BDS, we, we measure it on several levels. 
the political level, the economic level, and of course the academic and, and social media. And when it comes to the political level and, and to the economic level, I have to say uh, openly and freely that um, this movement uh, does not influence whatsoever Israel's political relations, diplomatic relations with other countries. We cooperate very closely with many friendly governments. When it comes to economic uh, cooperation, Israel as a startup nation has so much to offer. On, on medical technology and communication and so many other aspects that people are extremely curious about about the achievements of, of Israel and, and want to cooperate with Israel. On the academic level as well, we see excellent cooperation between universities in North America, especially in, in Canada, we see that in the United States as well, on research and development, on academic cooperation and exchange, student exchange, uh, missions that travel back and forth, good things are happening. On social media, we follow events, we have to deal with protests every now and then, with manifestations of uh, BDS, with uh, letters and petitions uh, every now and then. Um, all this is manageable, we can, we can live with that. I can't say it's not annoying, it is annoying for Israeli diplomats serving abroad, but we, we, we can live with it. Uh, in my opinion, BDS is just another expression of uh, anti-Semitism. It's as simple as that. Uh, when Israelis, and especially Israeli soldiers, are characterized as, uh, um, as if they were, uh, they were Jews who were described in the Der Stilmel in Germany in the 1930s, the same anti-Semitic characteristics, there is no other way to explain, uh, there is no other way to describe it but sheer anti-Semitism. But again, this phenomenon is manageable and, and we can live with it. It doesn't harm Israel. What final message would you like to share with our audience as we conclude this first interview in the new consulate? I would like to encourage people, first of all, to follow us uh, on Facebook and Twitter for wonderful information about, about Israel, about Israeli society and about our activity. Israel in Toronto uh, on Facebook and, and Twitter. I would like to encourage people to visit Israel, to go to Israel, to send their children to Israel to see what our society, what our diverse society, which is this, this colorful tapestry of Israel, has to offer to, to the world. It's quite an experience, and many people describe their visit to Israel as a life-changing experience. So I do encourage people to hop on a plane and go to Israel and, uh, and see how much Israel can offer to the international community. So many people have views, but not enough have actually taking the opportunity to visit and see for themselves. What do you think? I think uh, I, I agree with you. I, I fully agree with you. I believe that reading about Israel from afar, watching uh, interviews with Israeli diplomats, uh, hearing about Israel from afar, this is one thing. It reflects only an aspect uh, of uh, Israeli society, but visiting Israel, speaking to Israelis, eating Israeli food, listening to Israeli music, seeing how diverse and colorful our society is, is really a life-changing experience for many people. I do encourage people to go and visit Israel. Consul John I'm a real pleasure. Thank you so very much. Thank you for your time. I'll be right back.
Human age reversal, we may be there already. Human studies are now ready to begin to confirm meaningful reversal of pathological aging processes. These clinical trials aim to alter older humans so that they function as much younger individuals. Even modest success will result in a paradigm shift that will impart enormous societal benefits, such as sparing Medicare from insolvency. Life extension is not standing idle while 5,000 Americans die each day from age-related illnesses. Joining us are physician scientists who want to hurry up these technologies to keep people from aging to death. While life extension is pushing these projects forward, we need financial help to ensure these studies are carried through to fruition. This concludes our special show for today. I'm Maya Brandt, and thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.